Cuphead was a really popular game when it first came out. So popular that recently, it got its own cartoon on Netflix. Being based on a game means that a lot of things tend to get lost in translation between the game and the show. And while some of the changes are quite good, some of them we despise to no end. So when it comes down to it, which changes are which? I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and this is the Cuphead Show changes from the game we love and hate. And this should be obvious, but we'll be going into spoiler territory for both the game Cuphead and the Cuphead Show. So take this as a spoiler warning. The first change on this list we wanted to discuss was the animation. Yes, both the game and the show are based on old school rubber hose animation. However, if you compare the game to the show, you can see a major difference in the way certain things are animated. This comes down to the fact that while the game utilizes hand-drawn animations, and is designed to be more fluid with gameplay, and does look quite nice, the show utilizes computer animation and is designed for the more comedic, slapstick-style comedy the show has decided to use. Because of this, the animation in the show feels very different even though most of the character designs are pretty accurate to the game. The mix of both fluid and choppy animation in the show to make it feel like an early 30s cartoon is fun, but it is uniquely different from the game's animation. With that said, overall, we did enjoy this change because it made a lot of the comedy work really well. Speaking of, the comedy itself is another change we wanted to talk about. The game honestly held very little comedy beyond funny character designs and some cute or laughable dialogue outside of battle. Not to say that Cuphead was a serious game with cute aesthetics, or a dark and brooding game like Dark Souls or Metal Gear Solid. The comedic moments were just few and far between, unless you were interacting with each of the NPCs, or dying enough to see the occasionally funny boss quotes. Now, the Cuphead show focuses mostly on comedy, and the comedy is mostly based on rubber hose jokes, most of which are slapstick in nature. Of course, all comedy is subjective, but the jokes within the Cuphead show are mostly funny. There are a few duds here and there, but that's to be expected. Sure, they sometimes fall into tropes as most shows do, but overall, we do quite like this change from the game, because the simple comedy does work. The next change that we want to talk about is the returning roster of characters. Cuphead has a large roster of characters ranging from the titular Cuphead and his brother Mugman to the many bosses like King Dice, Grim Matchstick, or Sally Stageplay. Two fan favorite NPCs like Porkrind or Elder Kettle. Now, the thing about this roster of characters is very few crossover, especially when it comes to the bosses from the original game. Only Ribby, Croaks, and the Root Pack cross over from the original game to the show when it comes to non devil bosses. While some characters like Cuphead and Mugman gain actual personalities instead of being relatively bland player characters, the characters like Elder Kettle gain a lot more to their original personalities. Some characters are reduced pretty heavily, who we'll talk about later. But in the end, certain characters are really helped by this change, and some are truly dragged down. So we have mixed feelings on these changes. On the other side of the spectrum, we have new characters to talk about. Like any major adaptation of a video game, new characters are introduced to pad out the roster. Some don't get very much screen time, like Jerry the Black Market Swindler, while others, like Baby Bottle or the Ghosts, have entire episodes dedicated to them. Now, the worst part about this change is the fact that iconic bosses like Cagney Carnation or Beppy the Clown are not in the show and are instead replaced by some less likable characters like Baby Bottle or Stickler. While most of the new characters are despicable at worst and tricky to like at best, there is one exception that proves the rule. Henchman, who is a demon from the game, who now has a personality, and is a fun character who we actually enjoy. Wow, boss. I never saw you let no one escape before. But even his dumb, lovable face doesn't offset the fact that we would have rather seen more characters from the game. So we gotta say that we disliked this change. Which brings us to another change, King Dice. King Dice is the penultimate boss and recurring character throughout the events of the original game. He's the one who halts progress between the islands within Inkwell Isle, and is the one who initially lets the devil know of Cuphead and Mugman within the casino. He's a pretty important character throughout the events of the original game. 
However, in the Cuphead show, he's relegated to only one episode, and this is a character who is the devil's right-hand man. You hit him right in the palm of your hand! Though he is voiced by Wayne Brady, which is pretty cool. What the creative reasons for this were, we don't know. But it doesn't change the fact that King Dice is knocked down to a singular appearance. His characterization is relatively the same as the game, save for the changes to overall themes we'll talk about later. But that doesn't change the fact that we absolutely hate this change. Hopefully, he has more appearances in Season 2. Another character-specific set of changes we wanted to talk about was the Devil. The Devil in the original game is seen as a formidable threat with no moral compass and a massive threat to any and everyone who comes across his path. He has very few, if any, goofy or funny moments, and is played straight as an evil monster who cares for very little outside of his soul contracts. He's seen as a trickster who can manipulate anyone into being his minion, shown in the bad ending of the original game where he manipulates Cuphead and Mugman into becoming his minions after obtaining the soul contracts. However, in the show, his personality is vastly different. While he is still feared and seen as a trickster by the community, he's shown to be more of a jokester as well, and even shown to be quite dull at times, such as when he repeatedly tries to steal the soul from Cuphead in a variety of places while he wore the soul-stealing proof invisible sweater. Take it off and I'll give you 10 bucks. He's also willing to do manual labor like painting a fence for a chance at Cuphead taking off said sweater. And even after he got the sweater off of him, didn't jump at the chance to get his soul. But we assume he'll try to do so in season two. The devil has been seriously changed to fit a more childish demographic. And while we don't hate it, we have severely mixed feelings on this change to the main antagonist of the series. The next major change we wanted to talk about is the lack of gambling and gambling memorabilia. In the original game, there are more than enough references to gambling, like betting chips, horse races, and slot machines. In the original series, they don't show these topics in a positive light throughout the game, and King Dice is a very obvious harbinger of these ideas. These topics could have been handled a bit better because they are treated as pure evil and have no redeeming qualities, and they don't go into social issues that cause gambling problems. These themes were very important in the original game and helped to move the story forward in the correct way. However, the Cuphead show lacks any and all of this content and themes at the moment. Now, because of the younger demographic that the show is targeted towards, we didn't expect these themes to appear, but it significantly changes how both the Devil and King Dice are portrayed. Instead of being a shady casino owner, the Devil instead runs an amusement park, and King Dice is now a game show host. These things aren't bad in and of themselves, but the lack of a central theme makes us say that we dislike this change, though we may see these kinds of things pop up in Season 2. In a very similar vein, we also wanted to talk about the lack of other adult themes like alcohol. While you can kind of rope this in with the gambling point from before, unlike gambling, which is a central theme, other adult things like alcohol and smoking aren't as central to the theme and story of Cuphead as the gambling stuff. Now, these things, much like gambling, are kind of looked at in a negative light by Cuphead, but are still tackled to some degree, mostly during King Dice's boss fight, where entire mini-bosses are based on these themes. In the Cuphead show, there are no major, if any, references to them. However, this can obviously be explained by the fact that the show is targeted towards kids. But we don't see this as the biggest deal in our eyes. These themes, while prevalent both in the game and in the old rubber hose cartoons the show and game are based on, weren't really all that important so we're confident in saying that we don't mind them being excluded from the show. So we'll say that we like this change. Now let's talk about how the demographic for the show has changed from the game. The original game was marketed as a run-and-gun boss rush style game that would appeal to most audiences with its stylized art and very difficult gameplay. It wasn't marketed to any one specific demographic, at least not intentionally. Of course, some people feel that cartoons and cartoony games are only for kids, but with the aforementioned adult themes being a major part, we have to disagree. The Cuphead show, however, is indeed marketed towards kids, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, except for the previously mentioned gambling things not being a part of the story. Excluding that, the shift in demographic from broad or unknown to children and fans of the game shows in its comedy, its story, and its general presentation. 
I'm starting to get the feeling like we ain't wanted. There are a few dark or slightly dirty jokes for the adults in the room, but in general, the slapstick comedy and general feel of the show is definitely marketed towards children and young teens. And in all honesty, we like this demographic change because it opened up a few new avenues to take the characters as well as the comedy. The next change that we wanted to talk about is actually the music. In the original game, a variety of music stylized after musical genres from the 30s was the backdrop to every level, moment, and boss fight. Certain music tracks became quite popular on the internet. Songs like Cagney Carnation's song, Floral Fury, or the theme song, Don't Deal With The Devil, became quite popular, or even memes, because of how fun they were. And since every boss had their own theme tune, each boss fight had their own unique vibe throughout the battle. Of course, King Dice's song, Die House, is probably the most popular and most recognizable song from the original game, due to the vocals by Alana Bridgewater as King Dice. While most of the tracks fall into a few different genres like barbershop quartet or jazz, this fits the era very well, and makes sense not only for the game, but for the universe. Now in the show, while the background music is nothing to write home about, they do have some fun musical moments throughout the show. The soundtrack of the root pack, Botanic Panic, makes an appearance in the show, and Ribby and Croak's theme, Clip Joint Calamity, also appears and is one of our favorite tunes. However, what really sticks out are the variety of fully sung songs, usually by the villains, like Ribby and Croak's Ballad for Their Mother, or Miss Chalice's show tune-esque singles. But one of the ones we really enjoy is actually in the first episode with the devil song that he sings to introduce us to him. And it's practically a full-fledged Disney villain song. Now, obviously music is the most subjective thing we talk about here, and not everyone will agree, but we really liked this change because while a few of Cuphead's songs are recognizable and fun, most of the soundtrack is just okay. The final change we wanted to talk about is the story. We've mentioned it before, but the story of Cuphead is about the titular Cuphead and his brother Mugman losing a bet with the devil, and now having to go collect the souls of all the creatures who sold their souls to the devil. This proceeds to become a giant rush of bosses and beasts that the boys have to go through using magical abilities. Now, it's not the most amazing or complex plot of all time, but it still has significantly more plot than what the Cuphead show brings to the table. The show is not designed to have really deep lore, although the final episode of the season does leave off on a cliffhanger. The show is designed as an episodic experience, meaning that every story can be viewed without the context of the previous one. However, this can lead to some jarring issues. For example, episode 10, Dangerous Mugman, shows Mugman getting brave after a mission at an active volcano. I'm feeling a little dangerous. However, earlier episodes show him being significantly braver than he was in this episode. In fact, the previous episode shows him bravely putting the very damaging sweater onto the devil to severely injure him. Now, some sources claim this is because Dangerous Mugman was supposed to be an earlier episode, but we don't have complete confirmation on this. Regardless, season two may delve a bit deeper into a serialized story, of some shape or form, considering how season one ended. But in the end, we have to say that we really disliked this change. But that's because, as we said, it was never meant to be a very lore-heavy show like Gravity Falls, Adventure Time, or The Owl House, and was designed to be episodic, similar to shows like SpongeBob or The Simpsons. And we do think that they did it quite well, we just prefer the original game story. But let us know in the comment section if you agree with us and tell us what you thought of the Cuphead show. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our Cuphead show and Cuphead game videos. But most importantly, stay wicked.